everyone, and welcome to another episode of Date with Diaspora Talk Show. We're so excited today because we are joined by the one and only Dr. Mona Lisa Muchatuta. And Dr. Mona, or she goes by Dr. Mona too. So Dr. Mona is the Director of Global Emergency Medicine at Brookdale Hospital. She's also an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at Sunny Downstate Medical Center and Stanford Center for Innovation Global Health Fellow. Okay, so welcome, Dr. Mona. Thank welcome. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for reaching out and giving me this platform. This is exciting. Yes, we're so excited to hear from you today. And we wonder if you could just give us brief into who Dr. Mona is. Oh, wow. Okay. Where do I start from birth? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> we can start from birth, uh, I guess, quickly. Um, I was, <laughs> I'm a born free, I guess. Most Zimbabweans would know what that mean. mm -hmm. means. I was born in Harare. Um, born and raised in Zim. Went to primary school, high school in Zimbabwe, and then left them soon after high school to start college in the States. Um, I went to college in Indiana, um, so I actually know Musa's sister. We used to play basketball mm -hmm. against each other. My school is better than hers. Oh! But, uh, <laughs> in Zim. Um, and then, you know, when we moved to Indy, just because that's where I went to college, I went to Indiana State, um, kind of kept in contact, sort of had similar contact. I um, did my master's degree at IPY, um, got my degree from Purdue, and then um, worked for a little bit right after medical school, and then a, a couple, two years as well after grad school. So I didn't go straight to medical school. So I'm a little older than most people my age. Uh, I'm sorry, most people my kind of grade in medical school. Um, then right after grad school, I applied to medical school, and then I moved to New York City. I went to SUNY Downstate, so State University of New York, and oh, in, in Brooklyn. Um, Went to medical school there and then matched with my top choice, which was Kings County or SUNY Downstate for emergency medicine residency, which I think is the best residency in the world. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, I did a global health fellowship at Stanford um, in Palo Alto, California. And I just missed California. I mean, I mean New York. Um, I'm a New Yorker. I think when I was in, when I moved from Indiana to New York, I was like, what have I been doing when I finally, got to <laughs> you know, so that's great. As far as like my interests, my clinical interests, like I'm an emergency doctor. I'm the doctor that you see when you first walk into the emergency room. Um, you know, myself and my colleagues sort of pride ourselves in being the doctors that take care of you in that first two hours when the worst day of your life, you know, if you couldn't breathe when you show up, like I want to make sure that by the time I admit you, you can stab wounds, gunshots, abdominal pain, diarrhea, whatever, I can take care of it all, babies, adults, everything. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. My clinical interests, are, sorry, my mm -hmm. academic interests are global health. And this mostly came from me being, you know, a diasporan uh, mm -hmm. immigrant to this country. So I was thinking of ways that I could continue my career and be um, useful, or at least maybe set myself up to eventually go home at some point in life. Um, and global health was a very good way for me to sort of keep my fingers involved in emergency medicine and global medicine across the globe. So I have a lot of projects that I've done in Zimbabwe, in Liberia, in Rwanda. Most of my projects, uh, global health projects, have been in West Africa and East Africa. Um, Zim, I've only mostly done research, but I have a lot of partners. I'm a member of Zimbabwe Emergency Medicine Society, as well as the Zimbabwean Women Doctor Society as well. Um, and I've been a lot of task forces kind of with COVID now. So kind of a lot to try to, my entire life to cram into that like two seconds, but we can elaborate more as we talk more, but um, that's a nutshell. I don't think you guys wanted to know how many siblings I have. And <laughs> so you can get that on my social media. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. So as you know, we're going through a pandemic. It's top of mind for. Sorry, Charmaine. We're recording. So your voice is coming through. Well, I was going to ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Sorry, Charmaine. <laughs> All right, we're back. All right, so it's an audio studio audience. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, you got an audience. 
<laughs> the live studio audience. <laughs> All right. Okay, that was great. So like I was saying, right now, everyone knows that we're going through the pandemic. <laughs> so it's top of mind, COVID-19. And I just wanted to like ask you some questions. So basically, this kind of like two-part question. So I want to know, first of all, um, you know, someone sent me something on like WhatsApp that was telling me that the COVID-19 is affecting the Black population differently. So I want to know, A, if, if it's true that we're seeing different symptoms in Black people, and then also just talk about like the misinformation that we're getting from like these WhatsApp chats, these Facebook groups, these text messages, where people mean to do well because they're trying to give you this information. But I feel like I'm like, how do I know? Am I supposed to really just drink this water and cough three times and beat my chest and then I'll be okay? <laughs> so if you want to talk on that, expand yeah, on that. So, I mean, okay. So I think everybody's really anxious and everybody's really nervous. Like this is novel, right? Novel meaning nobody's ever dealt with this before. Even us, the doctors don't really know. I mean, when it first started, we didn't really know what, what it would look like, you know? Mm -hmm. So we knew that, you know, patients would come and they'd have cough fever and sore throat. And if, you know, we're expecting them to have shortness of breath, which is something we always expect with patients that have really severe respiratory symptoms. But we had those basic things and we started with people that had just traveled to Italy, China, and, you know, and Europe. Um, so nobody really knew that much. And a lot of the information that we know now is just from clinical experience and kind of seeing patients now. So to answer directly, how do you know if information is reputable and if you should really follow it? I'm telling all of my patients, just go to, if there's no CDC in it, if there's no WHO in it, you know, if there's no government agency in it, then, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, um, you know, CDC and WHO are very good about updating. New York, um, NY.gov is another website that we're using in New York that's being kept up to date on a day-to-day -day basis where you can literally look at the statistics every single day and see kind of what's going on. I wouldn't recommend that for somebody that's just, you know, a, a civilian living in the world and just trying to get by because that can be really anxiety provoking, I think. But CDC is really good. WHO is really good. And you can just Google um, COVID-19 symptoms. You can Google COVID-19 death rates or COVID-19 symptoms, you know, um, you'll even notice some of the news um, sort of reels that we're seeing, CNN or BBC, they always quote CDC because those, that's the up-to-date um, data. So I would definitely go to those websites to get inf more information or your own state um, department or department of health. They usually have really good statistics for your region as well as and county specific. As far as the question about um, COVID-19 affecting people differently um, and I, it doesn't affect people differently. Like humans are humans, period, right? Um, and, you know, there are the basic symptoms that everybody knows about. So chest, uh, sorry, cough, fever, sore throat, muscle aches, body aches, and fatigue. Those are the general symptoms that everybody knows. There are some other minor symptoms that we've started, started realizing that these sort of come along with it. And I had those symptoms, and that's probably why I wasn't diagnosed until later. But Abdominal pain is one of them, but very, very rarely. I mean, you know, um, some patients are asymptomatic and can be COVID positive. Um, anosmia, which is the loss of smell, is a very characteristic one. So if you notice mm -hmm. that you can't smell, even though everything else feels great, then that's something to think about and maybe call your doctor and talk about that. Um, loss of taste kind of goes along. And it kind of goes along with, you know, respiratory symptoms. If you have a cold just think about it the last time you had the flu or whatever you know you you, you do your food tastes funny right so you can mm -hmm. kind of expect that you can mm -hmm. lose taste of smell or you can lose your sense of smell especially if you have a sinusitis which is expected so those are that's just the general um that's just the general sort of um gamut of symptoms um but anything can happen right you can have headaches um we've been no noticing rash in pediatrics but as long as the symptoms are mild, there's nothing to worry about. Now, as far as how the populations are being affected, um, in New York City, we've noticed that like, if you just even go to newyork.gov and look at the cases in the city, they're mostly predominantly um, concentrated in certain zip codes. And the zip codes correlate to um, areas or communities where mostly Black, African, and African and Caribbean, as well as um, Hispanic, 
uh, background patients live, which usually translates to immigrant populations as well. Okay. So that's kind of what's been going on in the news. And that is a fact. That is not anything that is that people are just sending it to you to just say, you know, to just scare you. But those are the, the hard facts. In New York City, wow. mostly Brooklyn and the Bronx are the hardest hit because that's where those are the areas where most of um, Black and Hispanic people live or Latino origin people live. Um, and then even if we go to the Midwest, places like Michigan, you know, they did notice that certain counties where mostly Black people live, those were the hardest hit. I mean, there's d different, um, then we talk about the mortality rates, um, the debt, everybody, you know, if you have a poor immune system, regardless of what your race, race is, or if you have comorbidities, regardless of your race, um, you will have poor outcomes with COVID. The bigger issue is that, mo and what, you know, uh, epidemiologists have talked about is that, you know, African-Americans or African Black people in general have a tendency of having more comorbidities. Um, which is a risk factor, major risk factor. So diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiac um, diseases predispose you to having bad outcomes with COVID. And when I say bad outcome, it doesn't mean death. It might just mean you might have a really prolonged stay in the hospital. You might have shortness of breath, just worse symptoms than just the mild symptoms that majority of people will have. Um, but those are mostly, and for me, I mostly take care of uh, this Caribbean population. So I didn't really take yeah. care of a lot of non- um, immigrant population. This is a lot. But so I see you're in Brookdale, and I, I'm like, I've been to that hospital. That's like in Brownsville, right? I'm like, you have, yes. Because I, I, I love East New York, Brooklyn. exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's where my family lives. Oh, yes, so, <laughs> exactly. So you know exactly what it is. So even outside of just COVID, the hospital yeah. itself is predominantly minority um, serving hospital. And mm -hmm. even my other hospital, they're both sort of catchment hospitals that take care of patients in those regions. And you know, that's the community we're in and those are the patients that are going to be unwell. But when mm -hmm. we go back and look at places like Manhattan, their cases are not as, they do have a lot of positive coronavirus cases. However, they don't have as many bad outcomes or admissions or as many deaths. But that's because of the other comorbidities that our populations tend to have. And we also have a lot of essential workers in our, com in our communities as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, very um, informative. I wanted to ask also a two-pronged question um, about, um, I guess, the stigma of COVID-19, and then also, what do you think the Western medicine reception to traditional medicine um, being a potential vaccine option for COVID-19? Um, get it? I'm not a doctor, and I do understand that traditional medicine has not been tested and is unproven. Uh, currently for a vaccine, but I just wanted to get your take on the stigma of COVID-19 and then also the, I guess, reception of the traditional medicine. Okay, so let's just do that sort of the other way. So as far as um, traditional medicine, um, mm -hmm. I don't know what that means because traditional medicine would mean different things for different people. Like if you're in the Chinese community, traditional medicine is like cupping. If you're in West African or African or Caribbean voodoo might be counted as traditional medicine. And that mm -hmm. is not what we're talking about, just to be clear, mm -hmm. because I don't know anything about that and I can't really answer anything to that effect. And I think mostly when people say traditional, they mean more herbal um, mm -hmm. medicine. So um, some people, and there's different grades to it. Some people consider vitamins, some people consider the teas that you can use, like the ginger, turmeric, lime teas that everybody's <laughs> talking about. So I think, that every morning. I think, uh, right. So it's great. You know, it's great. As long as you're doing no harm to yourself, I'm not I have not done any research in herbal medicine for me to top down to it. However, I do know that, you know, and the argument that usually comes up is that a lot of the drugs and the pharmaceuticals that we use came from herbs and it's true, right? However, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of research done to validate the medications that we currently use. So unless there's, you know, research behind using a certain herb for something, then, you know, I'm really reluctant to recommend anything to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but with COVID, as far as with COVID and herbal medicine or any type of medicine, there is no treatment. So anyone that is claiming to have the answer or the treatment for COVID is just blatantly not telling the truth because there's no treatment, period, right? Mm -hmm. So everything that we're doing now is literally allowing your immune system to do what it does. Um, right. And then we try to optimize. So if you come to the hospital and can't breathe, 
my job, I know I don't have any medications to give you. There's no antibiotic that I can give you that's going to treat this virus because antibiotics only treat bacteria. So Mm -hmm. COVID is a viral disease. So if your doctor doesn't give you antibiotics, which I know a lot of my African people want, Zimbabweans and Caribbeans, Mm -hmm. they want antibiotics for anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a bacterial infection, you don't need antibiotics, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, And most viral infections, your body will fight it off. Ideally, if there was an antiviral for us to give you, we would give Mm -hmm. it, but there is none that's been proven. So how COVID works is literally your immune system has to just rev up and do its job. So this is where the traditional medicines come in. If you're taking your vitamin C, you know, mm-hmm. taking your ginger and your turmeric, your, mm-hmm. my grandmother has this thing where she used to boil guava leaves. I don't really know what it does, okay. but I think it helps with my cough. So, yeah. you know, you can do all of those things. It, yeah. it, it, it's supportive. It's just supporting you while your immune system is getting better. And that's the answer. That's kind of what I think the role for now that traditional medicines have, and even the medicines that we have now, that's all they mm-hmm. do. Even when you come to the hospital and give you oxygen, we're just supporting you while your immune system fights off the infection on its own. And yeah. then when you're ready, we take away the oxygen. Okay. Yeah, I like what you said there about how you let your body do what it does and you go there to optimize what it's doing. Yeah, I like that. That's- exactly. And that's actually why the comorbidities are such a problem, right? Because if you have no medical issues, then ideally my immune system is going to be working at 100. But if I have things like diabetes or high blood pressure that instead of starting at 100, I'm starting at 75 or my baseline when I'm healthy is 75% of what Dr. Mona is. Then when COVID comes, then you're starting, you know, you're sort of, at you the know, back. you're, you're behind already. Um, yeah. And so that's what we kind of need to understand. And if anything yeah. from, you know, we learn from COVID is we really all need to know what our health status is. I agree. You know, there's also that's patients true. that have been healthy that have gotten it well. But in my mind, and this, there's no research behind this anecdotally. My question is, you know, when was the last time this 30 year old person went to the doctor that was seeing, mm. somebody, right? Like the last true. time you went to see your doctor was when you were a, a pediatric patient and you, you were on your parents' insurance. Mm-hmm. And then in 2020, you, you get COVID and end up in the hospital. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, he was healthy. He doesn't mm. even, just because you don't go to the hospital doesn't mean you don't have medical problems, right? So mm-hmm. especially for men, um, they definitely, women, at least you go, you see your GYN, you get your pap mm-hmm. smears done, you get your blood drawn every two years or so. Yep. Or you but should, then, unless mm-hmm. something happens, for the most part, they don't really go to the hospital because they're like, I'm healthy. Nothing's wrong with me until we find. So I don't really know that a lot of these healthy patients that are being quote unquote healthy when they come, Mm -hmm. are they? Because they don't know. And for me, when you come, I'm just trying to optimize you. We don't really have the time to try to figure out what your history Mm -hmm. you have. I mean, we do test for like HIV and all these other things as well. But what, what is me discovering that you're HIV positive when I'm trying to help you breathe today going to help. So that's what Mm. I'm, so, um, vaccine, vaccine wise, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through all your questions. Sorry. (laughs) Wise, um, there is no vaccine yet. Um, and you know, it takes anywhere, on, and good it, when everything is well, it takes anywhere from a year to about two years for a vaccine to come, right? To be successful, to be tried and tested, and to be proven safe before we can give it to humans. Um, you know, I read a lot of WhatsApp messages from my mom, my aunts, from Zim people sending me about some Chinese trials of um, vaccines that they wanted to try out on Africans. I don't know if that's actually true. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually true because I didn't read the article to and even verify the article if it was legitimate. But the bottom line is there is no vaccine. So unless right. CDC and WHO say there is no vaccine, vaccine, me as Dr. Mona, I'm not letting anybody inject anything into my body until they tell me that I have, that it's been approved, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, most people, especially in New York City and places or people that have been exposed, you probably already have... Uh, suffered from COVID and recovered. And then at this point, probably have some uh, antibodies that you've developed. You've been hearing a lot about the Mm -hmm. convalescent plasma and um, immunity and things like that. A lot of people, we don't know yet um, how strong the immunity that these, the present having had COVID before is going to be. So it's not like 
we hope that it's like, oh, you had chicken pox. Like the chicken pox. Right? You can never get it again. That would be great. But the research for that has not been completed yet. So we can't say. So I think for me, knowing that I had COVID already and recovered, it's kind of a little reassuring for me because I'm like, okay, I was scared when I had it. I felt bad. But now that I've had it, I knew that I had mild course. So more likely than not, if I get it again, it shouldn't be too bad, right? Mm -hmm. However, um, this plasma that I've now developed is something that we're starting to do in New York City that people that have, were tested and were positive, you can now get antibody testing to check to see if you've developed antibodies for that. And the antibodies or your serum, you, people can go donate blood and that blood, can, the plasma from the blood can actually be used as sort of a last ditch effort for really sick patients in the hospital. If they, mm-hmm. their own immune system can't fight off, maybe Dr. Mona's antibodies with her COVID mm-hmm. antibodies may be able to help that person get better. But again, the research for that is not done yet. And so right. we're still hoping and praying that this is what happens. So... Yeah, did I answer everything? Yes, yes. you did. Yeah, that's about but I'm sure it will come up again. Sorry, I had to I had to pack I had to pack it in there, you know. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, stigma. You said so the stigma with COVID. So this is personal for me. Um, mm-hmm. you know, patients will come in and you know, you hear stuff people saying, Oh, I don't have the virus, or I don't have the, you know, they don't even want to say it, the virus. Mm-hmm. Like it's COVID. Like this is a disease that you catch by walking down the street breathing right? I touch a doorknob or I hugged someone that didn't even know they were unwell. You know, nobody goes out into the world and wants to catch an illness, regardless of what disease it is. Nobody chooses to have it. And this is definitely one of those benign things that I think putting a stigma on something that is so incidental is just mm. you know, pointless and counterproductive. Because one, what it does is it, it, you know, instead of me realizing that, oh, you know, I'm COVID positive, I'm so kind of in that window where I could spread it to other people. Let me make sure that when I go out, I wear my mask. I may not because I don't want people to know that I have it. Um, another thing, you know, that mm-hmm. will kind of happen is that now that I do have it, people sort of start to ostracize me because I got COVID. That doesn't make sense. Like what type of person gets COVID? Literally everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think just realizing that it literally everywhere. I mean, the news that knew um, out of CDC are saying that we COVID might have been in America as early as November 2019. Mm-hmm. So at this point, like looking at your neighbor, like, oh my gosh, you're gross is actually not really productive because this is a very isolated time in our lives. Like people yeah. are depressed and anxious and all kinds of yep. things. And just having people be afraid of you or treat you like you're dirty or something is actually not the best. I mean, we have enough problems in the world without mm. adding stigma to that. Speak on it. That's true. That's so true.